How's it going? I'm okay. You've just got me thinking about the Oxford Bar now because the guy who owns it, Harry Cullen, yeah. um, was in his time a traditional musician, a folk musician. And in August, when the festival was on, he played his first gig in 25 years. Playing fiddle music or playing singing? No, playing, singing, singing an acoustic guitar. I think I might know the bar. Uh, the Oxford Bar? I don't know. I mean, it's not got a, it's not got a rep for live music, but in fact, since Harry went, got back, strapped his guitar back on, he's been having little folk nights and things there. Little sessions, right? Yeah, I yeah, but that... there's, uh, you know, there's a few little pubs like that in Edinburgh where you just walk in and the Royal Oak is a famous one, Sandy Bells is a famous one. You wander in, you sit there, and before you know it, people are handing you a fiddle or a bodron and off you go. I've played the Royal Oak. I've done the session there a couple of times. There you go. It's, That's, it's mentioned in one of the Rebus uh, books, one of the earlier ones. He's walking past that, that bar and he happens to look through the door, and at the glass door, and he sees his nemesis, Cafferty, the gangster who runs Edinburgh, standing at the bar singing a song. And he knows that Cafferty's been let out of jail. He should never have been let out of jail, but there he is, large as life, in the Royal Oak. Playing, playing the fiddle with me. Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> so you go to the Oxford Bar. It's a real bar. And is it strange for you now having people come in as sort of a this pilgrimage for people who love your books? You know what? I mean, in one way, it's really flattering because it means they, they really get the books. They want to live in that world or they enjoy being part of that world. And they know they can they can walk past Rebus's apartment block. They can go to the police station. It's a real police station. Most of the bars I mentioned are real places, so they do make that pilgrimage. Double-edged sword, though, because when I walk in, I'm not who they're looking for. They're oh. looking for Inspector Rebus. Right. They're looking for this dark, dangerous, brooding individual, mm. this complex man, and they get me. And I'm just not him. Do the regulars mind? People, the, these tourists walking in? You know, Harry, who owns the place when he was barman, didn't used to like it because he said they would sometimes come in, snap a photograph, and then walk out again and not buy a drink. There's a Rebus walking tour in Edinburgh, and the guy, the walking tour guide leaves you at the door and says, look, if you're going to go in, um, they don't like crowds, but, they, but if you go in, do buy a drink. <laughs> Whatever else you do, do buy a drink. So how do you feel about people perhaps seeing Edinburgh, as you said, not through your eyes or not through the eyes of the, of, but, but through a very specific sort of darker eyes of people who would know your books? Well, you know, that's what I set out to do when I was a student in Edinburgh writing the first Rebus novel. You know, visitors would come to Edinburgh, tourists would come, they would see the castle, they would see Greyfriars Bobby, they would maybe go to the festival. They'd photograph someone playing the bagpipes in a kilt. They'd go away again. Mm -hmm. They were seeing a particular version of Edinburgh or one side of Edinburgh, but it was also a city in the late 70s with huge social problems, drugs, which eventually Irvin Welsh would talk about in his novel Train Spotting, um, prostitution, deprivation, and nobody was talking about it. Everybody was pretending this was this was like a living museum and everything was fine. And crime fiction is very good at just scratching the surface of what seem to be ordered societies and saying, "Look, there's there's some issues here. Let's let's talk about it." Uh, so I got in trouble. I mean, you know, yeah. the, the first book when it was reviewed, somebody said unlikely to be recommended by the Scottish Tourist Board. Uh, but do, I bet you wore that as a, as a badge a of honor. Badge though. of honor. And yeah. now, of course, there's a Rebus walking tour, and people come to Edinburgh looking for Rebus's Edinburgh. Right. And I should say, this whole time, I should have mentioned that Rebus used to drink at the Oxford Bar. He's, he, I think he'd more likely order coffee these days. Oh, uh, you know, this is my wife's fault. I blame my wife for this entirely. Uh, a couple of books ago, she said, look, your guy, Rebus, he's in his 60s. He smoked most of his life. He drinks. He eats fried food, takes no exercise. Surely his health has got to deteriorate. So I spoke to a friend of hers who's a GP, a doctor, and, and I said, what would you expect Rebus to have? And she said, amongst other horrible things that she mentioned, was COPD, which used to be known as emphysema. And I thought, oh, hang on, that's got the word cop in it. I quite like the, the fact that it's got the <laughs> word cop in it. Um, and it's manageable. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing that he's got that's going to slow him down and make him suddenly realize that he is not indestructible, that he is mortal. Um, and yeah, so, and that's good. I like that. People say, you've been writing these books for 30 years, you've written over 20 books, how do you keep the series fresh? It's because the main characters keep changing. But what about you? Is it is it strange to see your own character, your kind of trademark character, get older? Well, I'm getting older. I yeah. mean, he's, he's always been a bit older than me, but I'm catching him up a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, like him, I, as, a, as a wise man once said, I ache in the places where I used to play, mm -hmm. you know? So he's gone through <laughs> it a little bit before me, but, you know, my ears are going, my eyes are going, my knees hurt, all that stuff. Um, he sees a flight of stairs and his heart sinks. I see a flight of stairs and my heart sinks. So uh, I've never smoked. That's a saving grace. 
I'm happy you referenced Leonard Cohen in a Canadian <laughs> public radio show, by the way. Oh, we'll be getting more of that later. Uh, um, but I, I, he's not just aging in his in his body and, like you said, aching in the places he used to play. He's retired. The world around him is evolving. And he's evolved in a case where police accountability is front and center, as well as its relationship with the press. So, so how does Inspector Rebus deal with this sort of change in the police force as well? Yeah, I mean, there have been some big structural changes in the way the police operate in Scotland. Uh, that's number one. I've got to take that on board. Uh, number two is, of course, technology keeps changing. New procedures come along. So crimes that have been sitting there unsolved for decades, suddenly there's a chance of solving them again because DNA has changed, DNA right. evidence, analysis has changed or whatever. Um, uh, and, you know, Rebus is no longer a cop. He's now retired. So my m task is to realistically get him involved in a police investigation, although he's now a member of the public. And again, I enjoy that challenge. It keeps the series fresh. And there was this true like, true story of a private detective in London 30 years ago who'd been investigating alleged links between senior police officers and organised crime. He was found hacked to death with an axe in a pub car park. And that story has never really gone away. And I thought it's an intriguing start to a book. And I thought, well, hang on a minute. If I move this to Edinburgh and if I have his body turning up, having been missing for 10 years, Rebus as a cop would have been involved in the original missing persons inquiry. So now we've got a live murder inquiry, but also they are looking into mistakes that may have been made first time round when it was a missing persons case. So that brings Rebus into the current inquiry. Boom, it, it, done. Is, is it always real life cases you're looking for? No, but sometimes it's it just, you know, I've, I keep a clippings folder of things I cut from newspapers and magazines and stories that people tell me, true stories, things that have happened to them or, um, uh, things from things from history, from Edinburgh's history, maybe, and I've just uh, you know I sift through it whenever I'm panicking that I've got nothing for my next book, and something always turns up. You got buddies on the inside too, don't you? Like you have buddies in the police force who help you out. I mean, it's anonymous, but you do. Yeah, well, yeah, but most of them, I'm afraid, are retired now or near retired. So right. most of the cops I hang out with are now retired cops, and I tend to go to a lot of retirement parties. But yeah, in fact, I've just been touring in the UK with this new book and we did something different. We decided that every night we'd have an expert or two on stage with me and we would have a discussion. So I've been hanging out with pathologists, um, forensic anthropologists, um, serving cops. Uh, and that's been fascinating. And, you know, people come up at the end and say, oh, I came along because I am a forensic podiatrist. Mm -hmm. Here's my card. But the reason I bring this up is not because simply it's interesting in it, but it definitely is. But in, in reading this book, and I think even the one before, you're not always painting an incredibly rosy picture of the police. And I'm, I'm wondering if any of the people you work with mind that. Um, police Scotland, the, my, the senior officers might be a little bit concerned, but it's fiction at the end of the day. I mean, I do reference in this book the fact that there have been some big changes at the top in Police Scotland. Some senior officers have been given what we call gardening leave, and I, either under investigation for various misdemeanors. Um, hopefully that has in real life, that has hopefully all been sorted out now. Um, but yeah, I do I do reflect on it in, in the book. And also the way they, they now investigate a murder has changed. So the local CID, the local detectives, are no longer in charge of the case. I kind of crack unit are parachuted in to take over. So that leads to a lot of tension, a lot of drama between the local cops and these experts who've come in and trampled all over their territory. So you get, an L, you get tension, you get humour from that situation. So I've actually enjoyed the fact that all this stuff's happening in Police Scotland. And they don't seem to mind if I reference it. I mean, a couple of chief constables ago, not the guy in charge now, but the guy before him, when he took over, he got a bunch of Scottish crime writers together for dinner mm -hmm. so that he could exp he could explain to us what all these changes meant mm -hmm. and why they were going ahead. Really? Yeah, yeah, because he knew that we were taking that message out to the world, that yeah. people knew Police Scotland um, through the novels. Does that, does we that make writing. you nervous then to get too close to the people you're writing about? Yeah, I, I try not to get too close. I don't want to, I don't want buddies. I'm, I'm not buddying up to the police. I know some writers do. Um, if I've got a specific question or a query, there's somebody I can go and ask. But I'm not hanging out with them all day to find out what they're up to. Do you got buddies on the other side? Yeah, not so much. Again, they're all dead. They're all, all the gangsters are dying out. The old-fashioned gangsters like Cafferty, the guy who runs Edinburgh, are all pretty much gone now. The younger ones are doing computer crime right. and, and corporate crime, um, cyber crime. Um, they're, they're not doing protection rackets the way they used to. They're not going to bars and saying, we'll set fire to your bar if you don't give us 100 
pounds a week or whatever. So crime is changing and the people involved in it are changing, but it never goes away. I mean, crime fiction is all predicated on a very simple question. Why do we human beings keep doing terrible things, mm -hmm. specifically to each other? Have you found an answer? You know what? I've been investigating that for 30 years and I don't know how much nearer I am to finding an answer to that. A few years ago, I did a TV series, documentary series on evil. And mm. I got to, I spent months on it. We went around the world. I was exorcised by the chief exorcist of the Diocese of Rome. I went to death row in Texas and interviewed a guy who was on death row. I spoke to cops who'd arrested serial killers, uh, all of that, psychiatrists, about why people do these things. By the end of that process, I wasn't much closer to, look, to pointing to a person and saying you're irredeemably evil, um, but I could point to an action that somebody had carried out mm. and say that was an act of evil at the point at which you did it. Um, but Rebus is different from me. He's more of an Old Testament guy. He sees the world in, in absolutes, in black and white, good and evil. Once you've done something wrong, that's it. You're, uh, you're, you're never going to be allowed to be redeemed. Whereas the younger cops like Siobhan Clark in my books are there to put across my point of view, which is a bit more liberal, mm -hmm. shall we say, mm -hmm. uh, than Rebus's. So I've always got to make sure it's his voice and his eyes that I'm looking through the world. Yeah. You got, you got some... You got some deep fans here. I'm, I'm, I have to admit, I'm a little new to the Ian Rankin, into the Ian Rankin world, but I wanted to make sure I wasn't wasn't missing any of the questions. The hardcore Rebusites, what do we call them? I don't know. You tell me. I've Rebus, never come across that before. Uh, Rebus fans would ask. Well, I actually reached out to one of them. It's a, it's the mother of one of our producers on the show. It's a deep fan. Read all the books, and we we don't normally do this, but we got her to write you a question. Oh wow, go on. A lot of your work describes a side of Edinburgh that is dark, depressing, and corrupt. Does that come from the sort of noir genre you write in? Or do you see it as a realistic depiction of the life and politics of Edinburgh? Um, good question. And I think it's probably a bit of both. When I started writing these books, I, I, I wasn't born and brought up in Edinburgh. I arrived there as a student. But as a high school student, I'd always been writing stories and poems and lyrics and things. I started to write about Edinburgh to try and make sense of the city. And it had this darker side to it. In real life, there was this darker side. There was crime. There was poverty. There were social problems. Um, but also historically, the history of, of literature in Edinburgh uh, and also the history of the, the city as a real city is quite dark. There's everything. Acts of cannibalism, tick, we've got that. Mm -hmm. um, Jekyll and Hyde, written by a, a, an Edinburgh author, Robert Louis Stevenson, partly based on a real person called William Brodie, who was a gentleman by day and a thief by night. And he was a craftsman, he was a woodworker, and he was eventually hanged on a scaffold that he had built. Um, he must have been a template for Jekyll and Hyde. And when Robert Louis Stevenson was a child, in his childhood bedroom was a wardrobe that had been made by William Brodie. Oh, my God. And his nursemaid would tell him the story of this guy who was both good and evil, contained in the same person. Mm. So that must have got hardwired. And eventually, Stevenson would go and write Jekyll and Hyde. And I was very conscious when I wrote the first Rebus book that I was trying to rewrite Jekyll and Hyde for 1980s Edinburgh. Um, and I continue to do that. So it's a it's a complex, small, complex city. Um, and and I didn't read noir. I didn't read crime fiction before I started writing it. No. Yeah. So I, was an, I became an accidental crime writer while trying to write the great Scottish novel using Jekyll and Hyde as my template. If you're just tuning in, I'm speaking with best-selling author uh, Ian Rankin. Uh, we're talking about his latest novel following Inspector John Rebus. So in this latest Rebus story called In a House of Lies, boys finding skeletal remains in the trunk of a car in a forest, an old missing person's case is reopened. Um, I think part of the joy I'm learning of, of, of your work is trying to figure out what's going on as I'm reading it. And I hear that you also do that too. Like you don't really know what's going to happen either. It's true. I mean, every writer is different and every, even every crime writer is different in their approach, but I make it up as I go along and quite a few of us do. So but you, don't, you don't know. Like you, no, don't, you also don't know who done it. I literally it. don't know. I mean, when I started this book, I had a dead private eye in the boot of his car. I didn't know who'd killed him or why. Um, so I know as little as my detectives when I begin the book. And that's good, I think, because if I don't know who did it, probably the reader doesn't know either at the beginning, you know? Yeah. Uh, and the first draft of the book, which is pretty rough, pretty sketchy, is me finding out, as the detectives find out, who he knew, who was he connected to, who, what was he investigating, um, what was happening during the police inquiry when he was a missing person. I'm just going through it. I'm finding out as they find out. And so, it and then some, you know, somehow magically, about two thirds of the way through the first draft, usually, um, I go, oh, hang on a minute, it was you. Are you ever stumped? Are you ever two thirds of the way through the draft going like, geez, God, I don't, I don't know who's going to do yeah, this. Yeah, there was, a, there was a, a Rebus novel a few years ago called um, Hanging Garden. 
which is sung by The Cure, um, uh, The Hanging Garden. And the first draft was finished, and I still didn't know who did it. I just had these big <laughs> gaps in the text. That I, all it said, I did a little note to myself going, fix this later. Uh, <laughs> I can picture you with like, the CSI, the photos, and the, yeah. the wire, and you Well, going, it's true. Oh, I mean, when I start the project, I've got a blank wall uh, in front of me. And as, the, as the, the first draft goes along, I'm adding more and more post-it notes, more and more notes to that wall, how people might connect, you know, people that might have been there at the time when the crime happened, you know, and eventually go, OK, wow, rationally it was you and this is why. But, you know, some writers would not be able to do that. They would want to know before they start a right. book where it's going to go. I don't. I mean, I'd get bored if I knew where it was going to go. I think that idea of, of, of your own work being a mystery to you, a mystery, so to speak, is, is been interesting to me since I started doing the show. I, I came into the show as, from a musician. I didn't know that many uh, authors... Um, and I think I'm always surprised when a protag when someone will say the protagonist I write surprises me sometimes. Does Rebus ever surprise you? Yeah, I mean, all, that's why I keep writing about him. I keep writing about him to find out more about him, to get to the core of what makes him tick. And you know, as he changes, as he gets older, um, his philosophy of life changes a little bit. Uh, yeah, he does surprise me. I mean, it surprised me when he got a girlfriend. He's now got a girlfriend. He's not had one of those for a while, and that surprised me. He's got a dog. He hates dogs. But a previous book was called Even Dogs in the Wild, and I thought, well, okay, I'll put a dog in his book. And it was a stray dog, and he takes it home, and he's trying to give it to somebody. He's begging people to take this dog off his hands, but nobody will. So then in this book, I started writing it and thought, oh, I forgot he's got a dog. I've got to put the dog in again. So that surprises me. Jeez, what a lovely bit of magic that is, hey, that you can still be – like, you're, uh, it, it seems illogical. It seems like you sit down and you write these characters, and therefore you have complete control over what they do. It's, there's some beautiful magic that you can get inspired by and you can surprise by. Yeah, I think – I mean, that's what I like about – you know what? I mean, writers are just kids who refuse to grow up. That's what, that's what we are. When I was a kid, I would sit in my bedroom, I would invent characters, I would invent stories, I would write stories down, poems, love poems to girls I couldn't talk to in the playground at school, song lyrics for non-existent bands. I was creating worlds where I could play God. And writers are just kids who refuse to grow up. We're like Peter Pan. We say, we're still going to play with our imaginary friends, we're still going to play with our toys. We're going to have this extraordinary interior creative life that all kids have. And at some point, the adult world says, you can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. You've, your toys have to go away. Your invisible friend has to go away. You've mm -hmm. got to go and get a job. Writers go, no, thanks. No, I'm kidding. I like it here. Yeah, like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't blame you. No. But the, the only reason we do that, though, is because we are mostly frustrated rock stars and we've got no musical ability whatsoever. But you're in a band, aren't you? I, I've, I've rejoined a band. I was in a band when I was 18 for a little while, a punk band in Fife. Second best punk band in Fife. There were two punk bands in Fife. Um, <laughs> us and the Skids. Um, and then just, uh, you know, a year ago, maybe a year ago, a friend of mine who's a journalist said, hey, you know, I, I get together and jam with a bunch of guys. Do you want to come along and try and do some vocals? So I went along and, you know, had a six-piece band. And before we knew it, we played their first gig, which was this summer, was Kendall Calling, which is a huge outdoor festival uh, in England that was being headlined by the Libertines and, I believe, Grandmaster Flash. And if you went all the way down the bill to the very bottom next to Terms and Conditions, there was my band. <laughs> are you writing the songs? Or are you? Well, yeah, all our own material, man. All our own material. I do the lyrics. And uh, we've got one professional musician who, who plays in the band. Uh, mm -hmm. He's called Bobby Bluebell. He's, he was in a, is in a Scottish band called the Bluebells, who had a huge international number one hit with Young at Heart many years ago. Mm -hmm. He always teases me, no matter how many weeks I spend at number one with my books, he says, I've spent longer at number one than you have. Ah, I, I, have, I have a buddy. Well, my, 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 my father was in a band with he was younger. He wasn't a musician, but he was in a band when he was a kid. And uh, I was—I once asked one of his old bandmates. He's gone now, but I asked one of his old bandmates. I said, "What were you guys like?" He goes, "We were uh, two good singers and five good friends." <laughs> yeah. <There you> go. <laughs> so uh, we're going to close off with some music today. What what song fits where Inspector Rebus is in his life right now? Uh, yeah, I've had a little think about this when I was in the green room backstage before I came on, and I'm going to go for Van Morrison. Uh, he's a huge Van Morrison fan. There's a lot of music in the books, mostly because I'm a frustrated rock star, but also I think it tells you a lot about Rebus's character. If, you don't, if you're new to the books, you can find out a lot about him as a person from his musical choices. He loves Van Morrison, as do I. And I've gone for um, uh, Wild Children from uh, the album Hard Knows the Highway. It's, a, it's basically Van Morrison singing about his contemporaries, singing about kids who were born just after World War II, and that fits Rebus. And it name checks a lot of stuff that Rebus would have known about when he was a young kid and a young man. So, uh, yeah, wild children. Ian Rankin, thanks for coming in. Thank you.